Hi, I'm Cam Quarles, the CEO of the National Potato Council. Thanks very much for the opportunity to be part of this meeting. I enjoyed being with you last year, and I wish we weren't remote this year. Um, first off, I'd like to thank Donovan and all the staff for adapting this meeting and all your activities so effectively to this difficult situation. I wanted to briefly talk about the work we've done together on COVID relief. As the crisis began last March, our industry rallied into action. NPC, Donovan, and the other state organizations created a simple but effective plan to immediately provide relief. First, we had to push USDA to temporarily become our customer in the absence of the food service industry in order to clear out the growing backlog. Second, USDA needed to provide meaningful disaster relief to growers who were impacted in order to stabilize these family farms until the marketplace strengthened. I should note that on direct payments, it wasn't easy to get there. USDA initially left potatoes entirely out of the first direct payment program. When they made this mistake, we pushed back, using every lever we had to get them to rethink their decision. This included providing comprehensive data on the impact of COVID on our industry. It also included political and public relations pressure that made the imperative of our inclusion unavoidable. I'd like to take uh, just a moment to thank Senator Hoven and Senator Hoven's terrific staff for all, they all the, the hard work they did on this issue. Ultimately, all of this focused teamwork generated results. USDA responded by providing both the largest surplus commodity purchase program in our industry's history and the largest direct payment disaster relief program for growers in our industry's history. Let me say that again. In the two priority areas that NPC and the state organizations identified back in early April, the federal government has responded to both with the largest relief programs in history. This includes 50 million in surplus commodity purchases of potatoes, 46 million to potato growers under the first CFAP, and at least two and a half times more under the second CFAP program. All of this is along with significant potato pr participation in the Farmers to Families Food Box program. We believe these actions will keep us in the game as consumer demand strengthens both domestically and internationally. Looking forward, we have a new administration and a new Congress to work with. It took a while to finally figure out who would be in the majority in the Senate, but the Georgia results have given the Democrats the narrowest majority possible, 50-50 with a tie break. This majority means that Senator Debbie Stabenow will return to her position as chair of the Senate Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry Committee. Senator Stabenow is the lone remaining member of what we call the Big Four, the chairman and ranking members of the House and Senate Ag Committees. The others either retired or lost their election. During this new 117th Congress, Senator Stabenow and her new colleagues will begin the process of writing a new farm bill. Their work will be complicated by budgetary challenges stemming from payments due to the trade wars and increased, uh, increased spending under farm programs due to a flagging economy. The margins in the House and Senate are tight. The 50-50 split in the Senate puts great power in the hands of any senator who is willing to break with their party. Keep a close eye on one of the most conservative members of the Democratic delegation, Joe Manchin of West Virginia. He has indicated his opposition to eliminating the filibuster rule, which demands 60 votes on many pieces of legislation to clear the Senate. Senator Manchin will also have a pivotal role in limiting the use of, budget, of the budget reconciliation mechanism to push through tax increases. Budget reconciliation was used to drive through the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare on a strictly party line vote over 10 years ago. If the Democrats can't hold their 50 votes together, that mechanism obviously can't work. The Democrats also have a very narrow majority in the House. Currently, the House balance of power stands at 222 Democrats to 211 Republicans with two vacancies. That puts tremendous power in the hands of small groups of Democrats who may break with their, with their leadership. It also puts power in the hands of Republicans who may consider working on a bipartisan basis and thereby extracting concessions from the Democrats. They can effectively replace the votes that may be lost if skeptical progressive members of the Democratic caucus refuse to support legislation. Ag labor reform may fall squarely in this category as some of the more progressive members may demand a far more left-leaning bill than pass the House in the Farm Workforce Modernization Act in the last Congress. 
in order to hold that bill's more balanced approach, it may again require bipartisan compromise. Turning toward the administration for a moment, at USDA we have a returning secretary in Tom Vilsack. Secretary Vilsack ran the department for the full eight years of the Obama administration and has a comprehensive understanding of how to run USDA. I had the opportunity along with several other fruit and vegetable leaders to meet with Secretary Vilsack several weeks before the inauguration. Our long and detailed meeting about priorities for the industry indicates that the new administration intends to be very active very early. In regard to trade issues, it's anticipated that the Mexican Supreme Court will provide a ruling on our long-standing fresh access issue in the first half of this year. USDA has been extremely helpful in dealing with these cases. And we've also, we also have a very active legal team working to get the best possible outcome from this highly charged political issue. Beyond the Mexico issue, resetting our trade agenda will be an important step moving forward. We want to ensure that the promise of a new USMCA, Japan agreement, China agreement actually results in durable access for U.S. potatoes. We also have been active in working with the administration to ensure that surges in EU fry products in the wake of the pandemic do not undercut a weakened and recovering domestic market. We intend to continue to pursue this issue as the, as the administration takes shape. The outstanding work of Potatoes USA, in particular Blair and John Tosburn, on expanding these international markets is vital, and we work hand in glove with them in our lane on Capitol Hill. That teamwork is also on display in the nutrition space. As you likely saw, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans was recently completed. Its report was largely the status quo in regard to our industry. This is a positive and the result of hundreds of hours of work by Potatoes USA's team and NPC's team in responding to information requests from both from USDA and HHS. As this document sets the five-year foundation for nutrition policy across numerous federal feeding programs and informs com consumers directly, we have to ensure that the DGAs are based on accurate science, not activist fever, fever dreams. We similarly need to remain focused on ensuring that science is the controlling issue on regulatory matters. A return to policies such as WOTUS or an overreach on pesticides due to social media campaigns will cause great harm to American agriculture and the consumers they serve. NPC intends to continue to defend the use of science in making these decisions. The Potato Leaf Foundation began only a year ago. The goal was to provide a stable base of funding to support the Potato Industry Leadership Institute. In just one year, in the midst of a pandemic, the response has been overwhelming. We greatly appreciate the time of all the LEAF board members, including Greg Halverson and Keith McGovern. For those interested in becoming a Founder Society member, that deadline has been extended for an additional year, so you still have time if you're so inclined. Finally, I'd like to highlight our upcoming annual meeting and Washington fly-in that is occurring at the end of February. Though both events will be virtual, we are building a strong program to provide the value and access you have come to expect of NPC. In closing, from the NPC team, Holly, Hillary, Mike, and Mark, thanks again to all our North Dakota and Minnesota members. It is a privilege for me in ending my first full year as CEO of NPC to be able to do challenging work with such a strong group of people. Together, I think we are reaching our goal of delivering meaningful results for this great industry. Thank you.